Cool. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. I'm, my name is Darren Wharton. I'm the Director of the Lifestyle Medicine Health Research Centre. And tonight we have a very special guest who's presenting uh, in, it's actually part of one of the, the units in the Lifestyle Medicine course. And the, the unit is called Processes in Lifestyle Medicine. And um, I can say, well, I'm going to get launched straight into introducing our, our guest presenter. It's, it's Professor Gary Egger. And if you have had any involvement in lifestyle medicine in Australia, then you already know his name. And really, I probably don't need to introduce him to you at all, um, because I know that not many of you have been part of this space at, to a greater or lesser extent for some time. But, but Gary truly is an outstanding innovator and leader and um, you know, thought leader pioneer, driver, he's made so much of what's happened in the lifestyle medicine space in, in Australia that uh, Gary's been at the forefront of and, and still, you know, doing some incredibly innovative things and um, is just so highly regarded. It, it's a real privilege for us to have uh, the likes of Gary here sharing with us tonight. So Gary, um, I've given him a bit of a bum steer, it sounds like, in terms of the topic that I've given him. So I, I, I deeply uh, apologise for that. But um, the focus really what we're going to be looking at is uh, along the lines of the, the, the of processes in lifestyle medicine. What are the, the ways we administer or can administer lifestyle medicine? So Gary's going to be presenting just a, a bit of an overview of that for us and then specifically looking at an area that, that he was very instrumental in bringing to Australia and is involved with now, which is called shared medical appointments. And we'll get to talk with him and if you have some questions, then there'll be opportunity for, uh, for you to ask them at the end. So welcome, Gary. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to have you with us, as always. Thanks, Darren. Uh, now, can you see that on your screen? Uh, no, we can't. But I think, so have you been able to share your screen? Ah, there we go. All right, beautiful. Fantastic. So you can see that now. So I'm going to put now. that into a slideshow. And I'll start by saying I've got no idea what's on this presentation because I just put it up there when I found out that I was talking about processes and not the, the introduction to lifestyle medicine. But let's uh, not worry about that. I will also put the chat box up there so that if anybody's got any questions as we go along, please uh, type these into the chat, chat box and I'll stop every 10 minutes and maybe Darren can ask questions too as we go along. Uh, if I'm not on the, the right track of what you wanted me to be. So um, let's get started just looking at the, the again, the background for why uh, we do share medical appointments because the temporal trends in disease epidemiology, you can see the acute diseases have gone up until the uh, mid 20th century, and then started coming down. And now we've got at the other end of that um, graph there, the rise in the uh, uh, pandemics, such as what we're seeing at the moment. And we're incidentally going to see a lot more of, we haven't heard much about this at the moment, but a lot of the uh, causes of the pandemics are environmental and uh, population, and these are not getting any better in the world. So we're likely to see more pandemics in a shorter period of time than what we're seeing at the moment. The chronic diseases on the other hand have been going up exponentially since about 1980, in Australia and uh, in Western cultures, sorry, not since 90, since about 1960 in Australia and Western cultures. And where these cross the chronic diseases or the non-communicable diseases and the communicable diseases here is called the epidemiological triad. And it's a phase in the development of a, of a country uh, that they go through where you get this changeover and it takes governments 20, 30, 40 years to recognize the change in disease uh, um, uh, occurrence so that uh, uh, chronic diseases or non-communicable co communicable diseases become much more important and it's a different way of dealing with these than uh, with the communicable diseases. The conventional way we've had of dealing with it in clinical in the clinical situation whether it's a doctor or an allied health professional is a one-to-one -one medical health interaction uh, there's absolutely no evidence for this over any other form of interaction. And there's indications at the moment that it's probably not as good as other forms of health interactions. And there's several of these and several uh, coming up. And what we are doing in the Australian Society for Lifestyle Medicine is trying to come up with new processes that uh, add to the conventional medical approaches. Because if we don't 
have new approach, new approaches, different approaches, then what's the point in having a different discipline of lifestyle medicine? Not saying that that discipline is is competing with conventional medicine because it's not. It's actually adding to conventional medicine. But we have to have new processes if we're going to add to uh, that the the existing forms of conventional medicine. And this existing form, one to one medical consultation, has been around since days of tribal living basically where you have a, 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 a tribal doctor who consults with a, an individual patient but there's lots of other ways and things that we can learn from uh, tribal societies that uh, that uh, uh, enable us to do different things so the disadvantages are of the one-to-one -one model for chronic disease management are that there's a limited time with the gp the doctor or specialist if that's what you're using um, and that time is generally limited by, in Australia, the MBS. In other countries, such as the United Kingdom, they've got the NHS, which is a capitation model, so that the medical centre is paid per person, and it may well be here in the next couple of years for uh, the centre looking after an individual over a particular time. And that will uh, get rid of that limited time because the time then can be, more time can be spent with the doctor. Uh, you're dealing with chronic lifestyle problems which can't be dealt with under the MBS in the, the uh, six minute scheme of getting an item number for six minutes or an item number for 20 minutes or even an item number for longer than that. It's difficult to deal with that. Uh, there's no simple prescription for chronic disease as there is with uh, infectious diseases. It's not possible in some cases or not feasible in other cases to hand out a medicine that, to, for the patient to take and go away. The clinicians are bored by the repetition, particularly with chronic disease, because there's only a limited number of determinants of chronic disease. Uh, some people say there's only three or four, like nutrition, physical activity, stress, and smoking and drugs. Uh, there's actually about 18 that we've identified, but those four make up 70 to 80% of the causes, if you can call them causes, of uh, chronic diseases and they all interact with each other in a systems type model. So one, it's not a linear model where you change diet to reduce weight and therefore you get reduced weight and better health as a result of that. Because the diet is only one factor. It can be caused by a whole range of other things like inadequate sleep and environment and occupation and social uh, relationships and so on. Uh, it's If it's a non-medical group, there's no medical input, uh, which is most important because people do prefer to have some medical input, even if they don't need the whole of the consultation to be medical input. And that's what we can do with uh, a different model of this, not the clinical one-to-one -one model. And if medical only, um, the consult uh, could be limited to just education. Uh, if a medical only consult, it's limited to educational input and it's not, um, have no involvement of the clinical input from the doctor. And it lacks the lived experience of other patients. This is the main thing. And this is where we're getting to now, looking at a different model to the one-to-one -one model, which is the shared medical uh, appointments model, where other patients can contribute to the consultation and you get peer support from those other patients. So lifestyle medicine does this, and this is the, Global Lifestyle Medicine Association definition. It's a form of health promotion and branch of medicine targeting prevention and management of lifestyle related diseases with evidence based interventions that integrate improvements in nutrition, physical activity, stress management, social support, and environmental exposures. And this has been added on later. Bear in mind that the Global Lifestyle Medicine Association is now made up of about 28 different countries that have lifestyle medicine associations. And the global group is the overseeing group of those. There's starting to be some fractures amongst those groups, those different countries, as people move into areas that they uh, feel are their particular areas. And um, uh, there's likely to be more fractures, but this is what happens when you get an international association, an international movement like this. In Australia, we have a textbook. We developed the second textbook, I think, in the world, 2008, on lifestyle medicine. Uh, the first edition, it was re um, reprinted in 2011, a second edition, and it's now been done in 2017 as a third edition uh, printed in Europe, and it's now printed in five different languages in Europe. So we, it's a work in progress, really. When you talk about lifestyle medicine, 
It's certainly not finished. It needs to be added to all the time. And we are adding and discarding different uh, processes and techniques as we go along to deal with this uh, situation of chronic diseases. The components are these, and I'll just zip through these quickly. The knowledge is what are the lifestyle environmental determinants of chronic disease. You can't really talk about causes of chronic disease because under the classical definition of Cox postulates, uh, a cause is a microbiological cause, which is proof of the disease when you take it out of one organism and put it in another organism and it causes that disease. Whereas that doesn't work with chronic diseases because there are no, no microbiological causes per se. And so we talk about the determinants of chronic diseases. The skills and the art, what are the skills and the practices for changing unhealthy lifestyles and environments? These are largely the skills that uh, <coughs> exist in general practice and allied uh, health professions, but we are adding to these as we go along. The discipline of health coaching, for example, adds the motivational aspects of, uh, of uh, consultations to that. The tools and the materials, what tests, devices, equipment can be used to assist changes towards a healthy lifestyle and or environment. And these are increasing all the time because of access to the internet and access to a whole range of uh, electronic devices that are now available that were not available before. And then the processes, uh, the sequence of steps needs, need, uh, that need to be taken to establish a course of action to improve unhealthy lifestyles or environments. And we're going to focus on this tonight. Uh, so if you can consider what I've said to now as a little bit of background, the knowledge and the science would be the other thing that I would like to have talked to, talked at a little bit more tonight because we are coming up with more epidemiology of chronic disease that isn't, hasn't been covered up until now. And I'm specifically in, in uh, considering the psychological aspects of chronic, uh, chronic disease. And we, we call it MAL, which is um, meaninglessness, alienation, and loss of culture and identity. Most characteristic of uh, indigenous societies, but also exists in other alienated societies um, throughout, uh, throughout the culture. So I want to cover, first of all, this, or not first of all, uh, almost totally then today, and I'll stop in a minute to ask for questions this shared medical appointments approach. It's individual medical consultations carried out sequentially with a number of patients administered by a skill facilitator with others with similar concerns, listening and contributing. The two key words there are, or the main words there are medical consultations and administered by a skill facilitator. It is a medical consultation. It's not just an educational, a group educational process. And it has a skilled facilitator, generally a practice nurse or an allied health professional. And for those of you who are allied health professionals, you can get training in this uh, by doing it through the uh, ASLAM, the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. It's online, it's six hours, and you can do it in your own time. It's not rocket science, but it does teach you how to become a facilitator. The facilitator being the person that runs the show, basically. The doctor is there doing what a doctor normally does which is a, a, a individual consultation, but the facilitator is there to, to decide how long the doctor spends on each of those individual consultations, who to talk to next, who to move to, to the next process, to ask questions and so on. You can also have a practice nurse and a documenter in the team, but in Australia, that turns out to be too costly uh, under the MBS system. So we usually just use the doctor and the facilitator who is quite often a practice nurse, but uh, also an allied health professional, and, and a documenter, somebody to write in the uh, uh, medical record notes as we go along. So a practice nurse can do that, working with the doctor as they do it. And this is the way it's set up. This is a uh, shared medical appointment that we ran in Burke in 2014, one of the first ones that we ran. This is the doctor here, this is the facilitator, and this is the documenter, who is me in this case. And this is my business partner, John Stevens, there, who is a, a nurse, professor of nursing, who has taken on that facilitator role here. Uh, you don't need the documenter, but we had a documenter in this situation. The doctor was somebody here who owned this medical practice in Burke. And it's an interesting story because we went out to Burke to do this with the, doc the doctor that runs the clinic in Burke. And he had gone out of town 
on a home visit and wasn't there. And our doctor here said, well, what are we going to do? We can't do this now because he's not here. The doctor's not here. And we said, well, you're a doctor. You can do it. And he said, I've never done one before. And we said, doesn't matter. We'll show you how to do it. All you've got to do is talk to these people individually as we pick them out because we pick them out so that we don't get somebody who talks too much at the start or talks too little at the start. You've got to get somebody who uh, just talks enough, basically, that you can cut off at the end of that consultation and then move to the next one. And he did it as uh, just a doctor. He loved it. And then he became the president of ASLAM after that, the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I don't know what that squiggly stuff there is, but uh, we'll bear through it. So where the shared medical appointments fit is that you've got clinical care at this end where you've got one-to-one -one with a doctor and a patient and a group education at this end where you've got one educator and 15 to 20 patients. But this has no medical input and this has uh, no educational input or very little educational input. So the shared medical appointment is in the middle. It has one doctor, one facilitator and six to 12 patients. Shared medical appointments, Dr. Rob Lawson from the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine says they're like medical mowers. A mower is Japanese for meeting for common purpose. The term comes from social support groups in Okinawa. And these are some of the articles that we've written on this going back nearly 10 years now since uh, we introduced shared medical appointments in Australia. Um, Darren and I were at a conference in Colorado, I think it was, wasn't it, Darren? Uh, where Ed Nofsinger was talking he was talking on shared medical appointments and it was as, it was as if it was a, a fill-in at the end of the conference. We'd been to the Lifestyle Medicine Conference over about three days and then we had this fill-in uh, on a spare day where most people went into Denver uh, to have the day off. Um, I sat around and want, was interested in hearing what Nofsinger had to say and he talked about these shared medical appointments and it hit me, why aren't we doing this in Australia? It's such a logical thing to do when you're dealing with chronic disease. And Nofsinger had been doing it for some 10 years in the United States. He himself had got very sick and he was a, a, um, a psychologist, PhD in psychology. And he thought, what do I need in a medical consultation that I'm not getting at the moment? One thing I need is more time with the doctor. And the other thing I'd like to have is to be able to talk to other people who've got the similar sort of problem to me. So he came up with this idea of shared medical appointments where You've got a doctor, a facilitator, and patients there. Um, now, one of the problems, of course, is the health insurance regulations in Australia. The medical service will attract benefits only if they've been personally performed by a medical practitioner and not more than one patient on the one occasion. That is, two or more patients cannot be attended simultaneously, although patients may be seen consecutively. It, it has taken us 10 years since 2012 or nine years, to have the medical benefits people accept the chaired medical appointments does fit this definition because no two or more patients are attended simultaneously. They are seen consecutively. And if you can't do this consecutively with patients, then doctors shouldn't be allowed to see families where they see individuals in the family one at a time. And we may brought that up to the MBS and they said, oh, we hadn't thought about that. And so they've now agreed with us in writing that you can do, do the shared medical appointments and still get uh, rewarded through the medical benefit system. I don't know why those squiggles are there. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, the confidentiality in shared medical appointments. The first question that most people ask is, uh, how, do you, how do you pay for this? And I'll come back to that in a little while. But the second question is, how do you deal with confidentiality? In that group that I just showed you in Burke, which is an outback town in New South Wales, it was thought that everybody would know everybody else's business after coming into a shared medical appointment. We actually get patients to sign a confidentiality agreement that says that they won't talk about uh, what they hear in the shared medical appointment outside. Now, we've found that this is not really necessary anyway, because people only, only disclose what they want to disclose, and they disclose quite confidentiality quite confidential issues in the shared medical appointment, but they're, they're, they're generally not talked about outside that shared medical appointment. So although it is, doesn't seem to be an issue, we do have a, a, a way of de dealing with this. Um, and we've had no cases of confidentiality breaches in Australia. We've dealt with probably half a, 
uh, uh, 500,000 cases in uh, shared medical appointments. The Americans have dealt with over a million and they've never had uh, confidentiality problems over there. And if there's no litigation in America, then it's unlikely to happen here. America being the most lit litigious country in the world. And you can use it if it's of concern anyway. It's, uh, it, confidentiality is actually developed with trust in the group. The first time you meet with people in a shared medical appointment, uh, they are all very closed and sitting with their arms folded and not wanting to disclose anything. And unless you've got them at the end of that group, sitting with their arms open and their legs comfortably uh, out in front of them, then you've failed to get them involved. Uh, it's developed as trust in the group and they trust other people not to not to disclose confidential issues anyway. There are different types of <coughs> shared medical appointments and I'll stop after this for some questions. Um, there's the generic shared medical appointments, which are medical and allied health consultations and group sessions with six to 12 patients. And these can be physical shared medical appointments, which include a range of physical tests by the GP or the practice nurse in a breakout room. So they're all in the one big room, but you've got a breakout room where you can take people if you need to do anything that uh, needs a little bit of confidentiality, if it's some sort of uh, physical testing or uh, questioning, then the doctor can take the patient into the breakout room while the facilitator keeps the group going, discussing the topic that you're there to discuss. There's these, these types of groups, program shared medical appointments, uh, which we've done a lot of in Australia. We've uh, uh, developed this in Australia particularly, and we've done it with weight loss, with smoking, with chronic pain, uh, restless babies, and we're doing it currently with type 2 diabetes. And a program shared medical appointment is a planned program that's offered in a shared medical appointment over a series of sessions, and it might be up to six sessions separated by a week or two weeks, which covers uh, the, 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 the range of topics. And the way that we do it, we develop a program and we put it on PowerPoint with video and uh, audio over that PowerPoint for 10 minutes, which the patients share when they come in with the facilitator and then discuss with the facilitator for 20 minutes or so after that presentation is given and before the doctor comes in to do the one-to-one -one consultation, which adds to that uh, uh, shared medical, uh, adds, adds to that, that consultation, the, the program shared medical consultation. Um, there's another type of group that we call drop-in group medical appointments. Uh, Ed Nofsinger has done this a lot in America, and these are uh, heterogeneous groups. They don't have to have the one problem. Um, I've, we, we, I'm not terribly uh, agreeable to this type of notion because it means that you can have people with coughs and colds and sore throats and uh, tingly feet and everything come into the one group, and they just come along uh, because they know that there's a shared medical appointment on at one o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and they can get treated quickly rather than have to wait to see the doctor. So uh, I'm not a great uh, favourite of, uh, of the heterogeneous drop-in group medical appointments. The homogeneous groups, though, are a different matter. That is, if you get people with a similar ailment or background, such as type 2 diabetes, Indigenous men and women, and the elderly, and so on, a whole range of different issues that we'll cover uh, as we go along. The evidence for improvements of group visits over one-to-one -one consults do exist in the literature and they, it's becoming more and more uh, popular now, the findings for this. Things like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, arthritis, the disadvantaged, metabolic syndrome and so on down through this list, some of which we've done here in Australia and some of which we still have to do. Uh, in a published review of the data, shared medical appointments have been shown to lower direct medical costs, improve clinical outcomes, improve patient satisfaction, engage patients powerfully, provide peer support and maximise the value of patient time spent at the primary care office. In addition, they improve healthcare provider satisfaction and enhance teamwork, collaboration and communication across disciplines. So I think before going on there, I might pause and ask for any questions. Darren, have you got the uh, the uh, chat box there? 
there any questions? I do, and um, and and we'll open up to other, um, to others. Well, you know, this there's everything about this as you've just indicated on that that uh, that that slide there. It's uh, what what are the down that like there are so many benefits to my mind, and, and I think that for for many people in here tonight, this is I know when I first heard about about this, it was it was like a paradigm shift for me. And yet it was so obvious, I was thinking, why hasn't someone thought of this beforehand? We, you know, we know that we often need each other to, to be our best and do our best. And, and so it's interesting that, that you know, through millennia, we've been operating on this one-on-one -on -one model. There's so many advantages. Though. What's the disadvantages of SMAs as you see it? Well, the disadvantages as seen by the funders are that they uh, don't fit into the current model of funding, the item numbers in uh, MBS funding. And that was because they thought that this was done as a group and that you can't do medical consultations as a group. But we, we went, I went to Canberra three times to discuss this with them. And every time they get it and then you come back and uh, you try and do it again and they've got new people in Canberra and they, they don't understand it because they haven't heard about it before. So once they get the knowledge and it's starting to happen more and more as more centres are doing it once they get the information that this is not group education and it's not group medical consultations, it's halfway between the two, then they can see the advantages. And it's actually cost effective for uh, the funders. It's much cheaper. We've shown this with weight control program, which I think I've got on this group of slides here with weight control. We've shown that it's about seven times more cost effective dealing with patients in a shared medical appointment than it is on a one-to-one -one basis. You can do within an hour what it would take you to do three hours in a one-to-one -one consultation. And it bores the hell out of doctors because they're repeating the same thing over and over again. You've got to change your diet. You've got to exercise more. You've got to decrease your stress and so on. So why not say it all in one go and get the people who've done it to contribute to that consultation as well? So why is there the reluctance then, I mean, yeah, to, to from a government point of view, why, why wouldn't they jump at this? Well, they've sort of come at it now. They, of course, they don't jump at any new thing very quickly, and it's taken us 11 years now to, to do this. But they've sort of, sort of come at it because we went, I went to the UK a few years ago and showed them how to do it over there. And the NHS, which is a capitation model, where you know you get paid by uh, by the number of people that you see, not by what you do when you see them, uh, works very well for shared medical appointments because the less you see the patients, then the more time you've got to do other things like see other patients or go and play golf or do whatever else you like, uh, and that that uh, then works under that system. Whereas under the MBS system, you're just stuck with this one-to-one -one model. Uh, of providing information over and over again. But they're starting to get onto it now, the, um, the funders and the government, and they've brought in this new trial of a capitation model, which they're trying now over the next two years. There are problems with the trial, but uh, and I haven't kept up with the most recent uh, uh, findings in that trial, but the indication was that at the end of that trial, if it works out, then we will try a capitation model in Australia where medical uh, centres will be paid to look after a set number of people based on three levels of uh, seriousness of their problems, basically. They get paid so much for people with a grade three problems and so much for grade two and so much for grade one and so on. Hmm, well, well I've, I have some more questions, but I want to throw it to the, uh, to, to the group now. So I'm interested to know, um, A, if you've got any specific questions you'd like to, to ask um, Gary, then feel free to unmute yourself and ask that. Uh, but also be interested to hear, uh, is this new to, I mean, is this a new paradigm to, to, to some, some of you? Is this something that you've never actually heard about before and what's your first impressions of it? So over to you. There's a couple of questions on the chat, Darren. Yeah, okay. I can, I can ask them or, or do, you, do you guys want to ask? Mary, Mary do you, you feel free to unmute yourself if you yeah, like? Right. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I just wonder if this, because it, it sounds like it's been used for people who are re really need it, you know, if they've gone too far. Has it ever been used as a preventative measure for a group of people who are not necessarily, you know, need any treatment as such, but, you know, as a, you know, for a young people or? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's, it has been used by Ed Nossinger in America with just about every group imaginable. He's done it with homeless Eskimos in north, north of Canada, homeless alcoholic Eskimos. He's done it with uh, uh, a range of um, needy people in San Francisco, done it all over the country, basically. Just to get people in who don't have any problems, uh, you could do that. There's no, no problem with that. And we've, we've done it with uh, Indigenous groups here, with Aboriginal men, for example, because with Aboriginal men, this is their typical way of dealing with health. They've sat around in groups uh, under trees and talked about their health for thousands of years. They are totally uh, not um, used to going into a locked office with a white doctor one to one in a one to one situation that freaks them out. So if you do this, we call them shared medical yarn ups with indigenous people because yarn ups is what they call it. They, they call yarning or talking uh, the, the model where they sit around in a group. And we've found that if we do these uh, with people who don't have don't come in for any obvious problems. The problems come out as we go around the group. And you'll find that we had one guy up in Lismore, for example, a young guy who uh, didn't want to engage with the, the doctor. When we got to the doctor, I was acting as the facilitator. And I said, have you got anything that you'd like to ask the doctor? And he said, no, no, I've got nothing. He put his head down. And the other guys in the group who were older said, you tell him, you tell him. And, and they kept at him until he, he, he uh, said, oh, I've got this thing on my foot. And as it turned out, he had a, a plantar wart on his foot that he thought was cancerous. The doctor got up and walked over and had a look at the, at the foot and said, oh, that's just a plantar wart. I'll take it off as soon as we finish this session, if you like. I'll cut it out. And the young guy, you could see his mood lift because it had solved his problem. He wasn't game to go to a doctor on a one-to-one -one situation to discuss that. But in a group with other men, with his peers, uh, he was quite happy to do that. Yeah, that makes sense, because a lot of young men often have an aversion to seeing the doctor, not just young, but older too, and they're the highest uh, at risk for heart disease, for example, so it would make sense to have some sort of preventative measure yeah. groups in place. I should add too that uh, most of you here tonight, I imagine, will be allied health professionals, and you might be thinking, how do I fit into this? Well, <clears throat> uh, you fit very neatly into it because you can be the facilitator in that area of your profession. If you're an exercise physiologist or a dietitian or a psychologist, then um, you can, uh, once you're trained up as a facilitator and you know how to do it, which is, as I say, it's not rocket science, uh, then you can act as the facilitator and you don't need another facilitator. And you contribute to the consultation by saying to the doctor, uh, which we always do, we always go through the doctor to say, uh, I can answer that question, do you mind if I answer it? And the doctor, of course, will say, no, go ahead, because they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're sick of doing one-to-one -one consultations. They want to relax and listen to other people. And you can then use your expertise to expand on that in that, uh, in that group. Gary, I've got a question. Yep. Um, I just, I, I really admire that this is uh, kind of comparable to group training in the gym. You know, it's, it's as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one, uh, gym training session when they just, you know, run a small group class. Um, and then lots of people can benefit from the motivation that comes sideways as well. My question to you, Gary, is you said you've been doing this for like nine or 10 years, the SMAs. Do you, as a leader, do you ever take no for an answer? Oh, there's always ways around it. <laughs> you mean if you offer advice and somebody says no? No, I mean, as someone who is blazing a trail in lifestyle medicine, obviously there's been knockbacks and yet you keep at it and then 10 years later we're successful so yeah. how do you accept that's, yeah. the, that's the story of my life as Darren will tell you uh, uh, I've always sort of been out in front a little bit and but when you're out in front you get knocked back nine out of ten times but you get one out of ten that works and if you stick with it and you know that this is a good process uh, then it's bound to work at some stage I think I'll be dead and gone long before this is becomes a standard process in Australian medical practice, but it's already starting to happen. And it's certainly starting to happen in, uh, I mentioned the United Kingdom, but New Zealand is the other place. Because mm -hmm. of their health system, it's much easier to run shared medical appointments over there than it is here. And so they correspond with us all the time. 
It's so cool. I just take my hat off to you as a um, as a leader and initiator in this space. It's unreal. Thank you. I don't often get that sort of <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Um, Tracy has a question. I'll, I'll ask on her behalf. So she uh, she's asked: Are doctors using this pro this process trained in lifestyle medicine education, or are SMAs merely giving them opportunity to spend more time discussing the medical model? That, that's that's a great question as well. The, the doctors, it's not compulsory from our perspective for the doctors to be trained in lifestyle medicine uh, education because they're just doing what they normally do. But when they come in to a, a shared medical appointment, they very quickly learn the process. And the, the problem is if you're doing a program shared medical appointment in a particular content area, for example, weight control, which we did down the south coast of New South Wales, you get doctors who think they know about weight control, but they come in and they sprout uh, you know, conspiracy theories about weight control or mythology about weight control. So we insist in those situations that the doctors have some orientation to the latest scientific work in that area of weight control. I mean, weight control, we do at least a four hour orientation session with the doctors. And you also have a facilitator who can uh, um, jump in and say, if the doctor says something that's a bit outrageous, you have to be, of course, very careful how you say that. But to say that, you know, I'm not sure that we've got an evidence base for this, but the evidence base suggests such and such. Terry, I'll come to a question that Josh has asked Mr. Monk, but just to, to follow on from that, you've, you've come up with this notion of these program shared medical appointments where, can you, can you step us through the, the mechanics of that a little more? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, we, we <clears throat> you come up with a, a content, let's say diabetes, which is what we're doing at the moment. We're trying to do prevention of diabetes, so to get in with early stage diabetics. Excuse me, I'll just wet my throat. Um, what we do is we get a group of experts in diabetes uh, to meet over one day period generally, and we go through the, uh, the things that we want to get across. We, we don't uh, necessarily regard the experts as the end point for uh, the information that's provided because we have to put it into a lifestyle medicine context. And we know more about many of the experts about things like exercise and nutrition and stress management and so on. So after that day, we then go away and put together a package, which is uh, a series of um, PowerPoint presentations with a voiceover that uh, covers a, a, a one area of that topic. So in diabetes, for example, the first session is introduction to diabetes. And it's covering what diabetes is for the patients. Now, the doctors know all that, but what they don't know is the second session might be nutrition for diabetes or exercise for diabetes or stress management for diabetes. And so they need to, to uh, see the slides, which they can see because they're online. and We give them access to the links to see that so that they know what the patients have got, have been told before they come in. There are some doctors who sit in for the whole session uh, but once they've done it once, they don't have to do it again. But the doctors are, just do what the doctors normally do. That's the beauty about it. But they still have, uh, the, they haven't lost any power in that consultation because they're still regarded as absolutely vital in that consultation. If you have a consultation without the medical input, it's just a group education session. And we know with diabetes educators and diabetes uh, education, it doesn't work as well if, unless you've got a doctor in there with them. So, yeah, I'm interested in this. So you sort of delineated between you know, shared medical appointments sitting between one-on-one -on -one versus group education. Are these programmed shared medical appointments almost sort of a subset between sitting between shared medical appointments and group education? No, because they include both. They've got the education at the front of the, of the session. So they get 10 minutes uh, of presentation, which is online and it's got slides and it's presented by an expert in, in an area with a voiceover for each slide. Then after that 10 minutes, they get time to talk to the facilitator to discuss what they've seen there. And even as the slides go along, they, they can stop, uh, the facilitator can stop and say, has anybody got question, any questions about this? Then after, so after the facilitator has discussed the slides with them, then they call the doctor in, you call the doctor in, and the doctor then starts with the individual consultations. So it's, it's still not a, a purely group education session or a purely medical consultation session. It's both. Yes. And that's the advantage of it. 
So Josh has asked a question. He said, he says, to me, the process seems similar to the processes used in mental in the mental health field, uh, in terms of group sessions used to help others become more engaged. Well, again, the mental, uh, to my knowledge, and I'm not an expert in the mental health area, but to my knowledge, the mental health sessions are still educational, although focused on individual uh, problems. Whereas this is uh, looking at mental health on a particular aspect of mental health, it'd be a good one to develop actually, the program shared medical appointment. So for example, we're, we've actually looked at this, we're trying to get one going to deal, uh, to uh, develop a program shared medical appointment in anxiety. And so that you could, uh, you could then talk about anxiety in general, and then the doctor comes in and talks about specific anxiety with specific patients. The other one that follows on from that is depression. And you find that uh, a lot of depressed patients don't know that there are other depressed patients out there. And once they hear other people's uh, problems and depression, that lightens their load. They think I'm not the only one in the world that does this. We, we see this all the time with everything we do, that uh, people didn't know that this was such so widespread in the community. But you need the doctor's uh, uh, aspect as well as the educational aspect to make it a shared medical appointment. Mm. To, to... Oh, sorry, sorry Gary, how, how did you get the people in in the first place? Uh, there's different ways of getting them, but the best way to get them is for the doctor in the clinic to invite them. So if, if their doctor invites them to this new process and says, oh, look, we've got a new process uh, called shared medical appointments where we do this with other patients and yourself. And the other thing is that I didn't mention, we can do this online now as a Zoom meeting. We've done it. We were the first in the world to try this in the, about April of last year. And we, we tested it out with COVID. To start off with because we didn't we weren't able to get people in for diabetes because they were concerned about coming into the clinic because of COVID so we said okay we'll run a session in COVID and see if we can do it online which we did with Dr Kin Seng Lim from uh, the Mount Druitt Medical Centre and it worked beautifully uh, so then we expanded it to do the, the program shared medical appointments and the other the other uh, sessions online as well we're now back because we're sort of coming out of or maybe coming out of the COVID uh, haze, we're offering a hybrid process where people can come in to do it face-to-face -face or can do it online. We've got one group in Western Sydney, which is largely an Aboriginal population, and we're told by the, uh, the um, uh, health people there in that clinic that these people wouldn't do it very well online, so that they should do it face-to-face. Uh, and so we've planned a face-to-face -face, um, meetings for them there. But it offers more opportunities now because we've got these different options. Gary, how much, um, how much learning takes place um, and how much of the value of the, the session is the, is the interaction between each other and, and, and you know, hearing someone's story and that sparking your own, you know, throwing in, hey, you know, I, I have that happen too, or, um, how much of that sort of takes place in the, in the standard? If I had to put a figure on it, I'd say 90% of it is that. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example. In Lismore, we were running a group on diabetes, and there was one woman who said at the start of the group that she was having trouble sleeping, and she were, uh, her blood sugars were, were still high. She couldn't get them down. Uh, and the doctor who'd been seeing her, he was the doctor that was the doctor in the group, he, he, he couldn't work out why this was happening. And one of the other guys in the group said, I think I know what's happening with you. He said, what do you drink? And she said, oh, I drink a lot of Coke. And uh, he said, how much? And it turned out that she was drinking about four of those large bottles of Coke a day. So she was getting the caffeine as well as the sugar in the Coke. And that, the guy said, well, there's your, there's your problem. He said, uh, you're getting caffeine and sugar. And the doctor said to, to this woman, you never told me that you drink that much Coke. And she said, you never asked me. <laughs> mm. It's interesting. You used, you used an interesting word before. You said um, it doesn't take the power away from the doctor. No, because uh, the doctor is still the one there, but the doctor realizes his inadequacies in a sense because there are people, the sufferers of the disease, that obviously know more of the more than the doctor because the doctor has never been through the, the disease, and and a good doctor will admit that that the patients. Are probably the best source of information and if you've got 10 of them there I mean you got you get a hell of a lot of information from those 10 patients that the doctor may not have and even the allied health professional may not have in that situation 
So a lot of it is just sit, sitting back and listening. Mm. So does it take a special type of doctor to, to, you know, to embrace something like this? We, we've found, and Ed Nofsinger found, that any doctor can do it. But if you've got a very shy doctor, it's a little bit harder to get them uh, drawn out in the group situation. If you've got a uh, dogmatic doctor who insists on only his way and nobody else's, then that's a bit of a problem as well. But that's, that then falls back on the skills of the facilitator. And that's why practice nurses are so good at this because they deal with doctors all the time and they deal with patients all the time and they know how to politely tell people to shut up <laughs> and <laughs> pass on to the next person. And uh, I've done that myself, particularly in, with Aboriginal men. Aboriginal men uh, like ragging each other about various things. They're always having a go at each other about something. And we've had one guy who kept butting in and talking about how he knew this and he knew that. And I, I thought, I've got to silence this guy right from the start, otherwise I'm in trouble. And so I said to him, I think I know what your problem is even before we discuss it. And he said, yeah, what's that? And I said, you've got... Uh, a disease of the tongue, you can't stop it flapping. And the other said, yeah, shut up. <laughs> and he, didn't, he, he was very quiet for the rest of the, the group. I got that, and I, I might add this if I've just got another minute to add to it. I've done, I've worked in jails, not with shared medical appointments, but with uh, uh, lifestyle medicine in the past. And I was in Long Bay uh, once when I was locked in a room with the Milpera Bikey Massacre mob. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the guard was outside the door, couldn't hear what was going on. And right from the start, I got heckled by a guy up the back. Oh, what would you know? What you know? All this sort of stuff. And so I thought, well, I've got to say something to this guy or he's just going to run right over me for, over the whole thing. And I said, will you shut up? There are some other guys in this room who might want to hear this. And Jock, who was the leader of the, uh, the uh, one of the two bikey groups there, turned around and said, shut up and pull your head in. He said, I want to hear this. And he came up to me at the end of the session and he said, he said, mate, if you had a time, if I had learned that in school, I wouldn't be in here today. <laughs> he said, that was fantastic. And he said, uh, you know, the, the guy that was uh, buttoning up the back, uh, we, we just shut him up and, he, and we never heard from him again. Wow. Well, obviously, there's a skill to facilitation. So, hey, we've got a few minutes left. If anyone's got a question, um, now is the time to ask it. But before we get there, um, what I will, well, actually, any, is, let's, I'll give 30, 20 seconds. If anyone's got a question to ask, just feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, Gary, it's Leah here. I just put a question on the chat, and I think um, Marit had something similar, but just wondering how often do the appointments occur? Are they single, or how are they followed up, or are they recurring? Okay, with, with single um, appointments, they can occur every two months or three months or whenever you like because the patients only have to come in for one of those and it might be just a general information session on diabetes, for example. If you were going to do it as a program shared medical appointment with diabetes, with weight control, with chronic pain, with those sorts of things, you generally space them two weeks apart and you generally have about six sessions because you need the two weeks apart for them to learn and to practice what they've, they've done in that uh, session. Um, with quitting smoking, though, we've done it uh, each week for four weeks because they want to get bombarded with information. And so it, it's horses for courses, basically, what, the, whatever topic that you're, you're dealing with. So it can be one off. And look, I suggest that if you haven't done this, you do it. You just jump in at the deep end, which is what I did when I came back from America. And you make mistakes, but uh, people are very forgiving in that sort of situation. And we've found that 99%, I think I've had one man in the first 350 that we tried, who said, oh, I'm not sure that this process is for me. I'm a bit shy, so don't talk up that much. Uh, you get 100% of the doctors and the facilitators who like the process. They don't want to do it all the time, obviously. They do it, they combine it with the one-to-one -one consultation, which is the way to do it. Because if there's somebody in a, in a, a shared medical appointment that needs some confidential treatment, uh, the doctor will say, oh, you better come to see me after this session or we'll make an appointment for you after this session. And you can actually prescribe medications during the session as well. And the facilitator can write out that prescription and the, the patient can pick that up at the end of the, the session. The, the one thing that's uh, always said about shared medical appointments, if you've seen one, you've only seen one shared medical appointment. So it's really what, however you like to make them. Mm -hmm. 
And how were they followed up? Well, they're followed up by another shared medical appointment or by an individual consultation mm. with the with the doctor. Yeah. Or or practice nurse or whatever. Mm. Very good. Has anyone got any last question for Gary? I've got a couple more slides. I don't know what I've got on here, but I'll just sure. read some testimonials. It's good to hear of other people's issues. It makes you realise you're not alone and you're not as bad off as you think. This was a 42-year-old man in Queensland. He had HIV, he had his scrotum removed, he had cancer, he had heart problems, all these problems. And he says, it makes you realise you're not as bad off as you think. How much worse off can you get than that? So uh, it, it really is quite satisfying for those sorts of people. As a result of this group, I'm more aware of my condition and therefore managing it with more confidence. I got so much out of this because I heard answers to questions that I always forget to ask the doctor. You'll see people come into a shared medical appointment with a list of questions as they do when they go into the doctor. And you'll see they get halfway through the SMA and they'll throw the list away because all their questions have been answered. For me, it just feels so much more relaxed than an individual consultation. This is the GP that we worked with. And in one-to-one -one consultations, it doesn't matter that much if I get my facts wrong, this is a doctor too, or advice slightly off, as I won't see them again for ages. And they have no one to check with anyway. In the SMA, you can't do that because someone in your patient group or team are going to know more than you about some things. That's a, you can't fudge it. It's a very honest doctor there. And it's novel and breathing life into my practice and desire to improve my knowledge and skills for real. I like the spotlight on me. It energizes me to perform better with other people watching. So this is the writings that we've done in the, those areas. Uh, and just very quickly, this is the results from uh, a group of, of, uh, uh, in weight control down the South Coast. It's been published in the Australian Journal of General Practice. And you can see these are the males and these are the controls here, the females and the controls. And we found that shared medical appointments were shown to be four times more cost effective and seven times more time effective than comparative one-to-one -one consulting. Weight control is a great one for doing shared medical appointments because people always work better when they uh, work with peers on weight control. And I won't go into any more of this, Darren, if you want to. Sorry, these are just the some of the, <coughs> the sessions for di di diabetes, for example, understanding pre-diabetes, moving muscles more, eating differently, feeding the mind, moving muscles more. And this comes as a package. So people, can, the Medical centres can download this package, play it, and then run the shared medical appointment. Mm. Hey, look, you know, I, 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 everything about this just seems right to me, and, and I see, um, you know, so, so much potential. And, and I, I hope that, um, well, you said that you think that it won't be mainstream uh, in your lifetime, but I think it's going to be well and truly in within the next fifty years. So I think you're safe. And um, uh, what, what I'm, um, what, what I would like to, um, to uh, just ask you. Is it for allied health professionals who might be on this in this session or listening to this recording? What's the process if they're interested in exploring more and perhaps getting trained in this? What's the pathway for that? Well, the first process is to go and look at the uh, the, the um, content on the Aslam web website, which is lifestylemedicine.org.au, and it explains about shared medical appointments, and then it gives you access to the train the facilitator training. There is a cost for that, but it's done in your own time over about six hours. And once you get that and you do a little exam at the end, you get you become a, an accredited facilitator for shared medical appointments. And those who work in medical centres can take that with them. It's a it's a qualification that you uh, that you carry around to different medical centres. Fantastic. Hey, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight, especially thank you to, to you, Gary, once again for, for your innovative leadership. And um, yeah, I just, to my mind, I love this model. Just for those who are in the, the processes of lifestyle medicine unit and, um, and this module in particular, just keep in mind that what we've been talking about are some of the different ways that lifestyle is being, being administered. And um, so the question remains, what do you think of this, of shared medical appointments? Is this one of the, the pivotal way forwards for, for lifestyle medicine? Uh, being championed in, in our healthcare system. So thank you again, Gary. Thank you for, all for joining us and hope you have a, a great evening. I'm going to stop the recording right now.